Let's go out to our schedule briefing. Um, turning to Ethiopia, I can tell you that we remain extremely concerned about the continued escalation of hostilities in the northern part of the country, including new airstrikes over the weekend in Tigray. Yesterday, two airstrikes were reported on a textile factory in Adwa town, that's in the central zone of Tigray, and in May uh, Tibri, a town in the northwestern zone of Tigray. According to reports, three civilians were injured in the airstrikes in the town of Meitsebri. Our colleagues on the ground are verifying the details of the airstrike and the impact on civilians. Fighting has also reportedly continued in multiple locations in Amhara, uh, leading to the displacements of thousands of people. We continue to remind all of the parties involved in this conflict of their obligations under international humanitarian law to protect civilians and civilian infrastructure. We also continue to call on all parties to the conflict to facilitate the free and sustained movement of humanitarian workers and supplies in Tigray, Afar, and Amhara. Um, yesterday, Tor Veneslan, the UN Special Coordinator for the Middle East Peace Process, said he was deeply concerned by the continued Israeli settlement expansion in the occupied West Bank, including East Jerusalem. This followed the announcement by the Israeli authorities of tenders for the construction of more than 1,300 housing units in the occupied West Bank. Mr. Venislan reiterated that all settlements are illegal under international law and remain a substantial obstacle to peace and must cease immediately. Uh, a quick note on the DSG, uh, on travel by senior officials. Uh, the DSG, uh, Deputy Secretary General Mina Mohammed, arrived in the United Arab Emirates to attend on behalf of the Secretary General Expo 2020 and participate in the ceremony honoring UN Day. She also met with senior government officials and the UN country team. On Sunday, the Deputy Secretary General traveled to Saudi Arabia to participate on behalf of the Secretary General in the inaugural launch of the Middle East Green Initiative, which happened today in Riyadh. During her time in Saudi Arabia, the Deputy Secretary General would meet with senior government officials, UN officials, and the leadership of the Islamic Development Bank. She'll be heading back to New York tomorrow. And just as you know, um, Rosemary De Carlo was last week um, in uh, Libya and also in Tunisia. Uh, in Tunis, Ms. Di Carlo met with the Tunisian Foreign Minister, Gerandi, uh, as well as the resident coordinator and members of the UN country team. Discussions with authorities focused on regional developments and the situation in the country. During her meeting with the Foreign Minister, Ms. Di Carlo expressed support for the people of Tunisia and the consolidation of democracy in the country and reiterated the UN's readiness to offer support for an inclusive dialogue process. She further commended the role of Tunisia as a non-permanent member of the Security Council. Moving on to Afghanistan, the Food and Agriculture Organization today um, and the World Food Program today warned that more than half of the population of Afghanistan, that's a record 22.8 million people, will face acute food insecurity starting in November. According to the latest integrated food security phase classification report, the combined impacts of drought, conflict, COVID-19, and the economic crisis have severely impacted lives, livelihoods, and people's access to food. The report reflects a 37% increase in the number of Afghans facing acute hunger since the last assessment was issued in April of this year. Among those at risk are 3.2 million children under the age of five who are expected to suffer from acute malnutrition by the end of this year. This is just a further reminder of the need uh, for donors to transform pledges into cash uh, so we can fund our humanitarian activities throughout Afghanistan. Uh, turning to Haiti, where humanitarian colleagues are telling us that lives are likely to be lost if fuel supplies do not reach hospitals immediately. Roadblocks are preventing the delivery of fuel, creating obstacles to the provision of essential services and also preventing access to humanitarian by humanitarian workers. Hospitals and medical centers are hit especially hard in Port-au-Prince as well as other cities. Hospitals are reporting extremely low fuel reserves needed to power generators that keep services going. In two of the capital's major hospitals, pediatric services for 300 children 
maternal health care for 45 women and critical care for 70 other patients will be interrupted if supplies are not received tomorrow. We are calling on all those who have an influence over the current situation to ensure that fuel supplies can be delivered to hospitals and that humanitarian access to earthquake impacted victims in the southwest is not further disrupted. This morning, the Secretary General spoke in a video message to the event marking the 25th anniversary of the UN Trust Fund to End Violence Against Women. He said that for 25 years, the Trust Fund has played an important role in the only global grant-making mechanism exclusively dedicated to eradicating violence against women. He congratulated the fund for its record of support of over 600 initiatives led by civil society in 140 countries and territories. Um, we heard a bit about climate from Mr. Steiner, and I can tell you that tomorrow uh, the Secretary General will be here in this room at 9.15 to launch the UN Environment Program's Emissions Gap Report. He will be joined virtually by the Executive Director of UNEP, Inger Anderson. Um, and today the World Meteorological Organization released its Greenhouse Gas Bulletin, which says that abundance of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere once again reached a new record last year with the annual rate of increase above the 2011-2020 average. The report says the economic slowdown from the pandemic did not have any discernible impact on the atmospheric levels of greenhouse gases and their growth rates, although there was a temporary decline in new emissions. And the UN Framework Convention for Climate Change today published, published an update of the synthesis countries nationally determined uh, published a synthesis of countries' nationally determined contributions. The update confirms the updated or that the updated or new climate action plans can be effective in reducing greenhouse gases. Um, however, the updated report also confirms that for all available NDCs, uh, all of, of all 192 parties taken together, a sizable increase of about 16% in global greenhouse gas emissions in 2030 compared to 2010 is anticipated. Patricia Espinoza, the D executive director of the UNFCCC, urges countries to raise the level of ambition in their nationally determined contributions, stressing that we are now nowhere where science says we need to be. And uh, finally, we will end with our daily uh, budget quiz. Um, we welcome the 133rd member state to pay up. I'll tell you, a citizen of this member state was the flag bearer in both the Winter Olympics and the Summer Olympics of 2016 and 2018. And he was shirtless in both Olympics. What country did he represent? He was also well-oiled, as one of my staff members put it. Tonga. Tonga. Um, Does that mean he does two different sports? Uh, he, I don't know. He was here. He was a guest here in 2015 or 16. Um, anyway, uh, all joking aside, we say thank you to Tonga. Since no one got it, and there are no questions. All right, Senora. Thanks, Stefan. Um, my question is on the caravan that it left this weekend, the area of Tapachula, where migrants had been waiting for asylum uh, requests to be processed. Um, what is the response of the Secretary General? Because a lot of them have said that they've been waiting for a year to be able to get a process. A lot of them have complained about the fact that it is not enough um, response by local authorities. Mexico has become a country of destination now with a lot of the migrants. Um, and especially now, many of them are not actually going to the border, but they're going to Mexico City to try to see if they processes might be expedited? Well, I, first and foremost, it's important that migrants be treated with, uh, with respect and dignity, that those who are applying for refugee status uh, do it, uh, that those, those uh, requests be treated quickly. But this, you know, we have seen groups of people move throughout Central America in the last few years. We all need to look at the root causes of what forces people to decide that they will be forced to leave their homes in search of a better life. And that has to do with economic development. It has to do with human rights. It has to do uh, with climate change. And it's yet just another reminder of, for member states to deal um, as a whole on the issue of, of migration and work through the, the global migration compact that we have. 
that countries of destination, countries of origin, um, and countries of transit all need to work together to make sure that people are treated um, with the minimum of, uh, of human dignity, at least, in, in the least. Thank you. If to sum, and then we'll go to Joe. Steph, I have um, a couple of questions about Palestine and Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, so the first one, uh, the Israeli government designated uh, one of the oldest Palestinian human rights organizations, Al-Haq, uh, as a terrorist organization. Just as a reminder, probably you know, that Al-Haq and Bat Salim have won several international awards, including in 2018, a joint uh, reception of the French Republic Human Rights. Uh, Al-Haq is not the only. There are six Palestinian civil society organizations that were designated as terrorist organizations, including organizations that work on human, uh, not only human rights, but women's rights, farmers, etc. So do you have any comments? Uh, yes, I think uh, you, may have, um, you may have seen, but Lynn Hastings, uh, the humanitarian coordinator, uh, for the, the humanitarian coordinator uh, in, uh, based in Jerusalem uh, issued a statement expressing her concern about this. Um, you know, we, I think it's our office in, uh, in Jerusalem in addressing the issue continues to engage with the Israeli authorities and the concerned parties. Uh, I think the Secretary General has repeatedly expressed concern about the shrinking civil, the shrinking space for civil society in many places around the world, including in Israel and the occupied Palestinian territory. Um, a follow-up on the statement you read regarding uh, settlements uh, and the issuing or the process mm -hmm. now of uh, issuing more than 1,355 uh, units. Um, uh, is, um, in, in a statement, the uh, executive, executive um, uh, the head of the um, Human Rights Watch, uh, described this as a war crime under art, Article 49 of uh, Fourth Geneva Convention. Do you agree with that? And do you have a, more to say than just expressing uh, concern about this well, announcement. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not going to comment on what Human Rights Watch said, but I will tell you that we have repeatedly, over and over again, uh, expressed our concern, both publicly and, in, and privately, in discussions uh, with Israeli authorities about the continuing uh, settlement, build, constructions of settlements in the occupied Palestinian territory. Sorry, just a follow-up. I mean, uh, do you believe that this is enough? Do you believe that, it, I mean, as a matter of fact, the Israeli government is not really caring about concern, well, whether for the well, in or other, the, 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 as long as there's the, no The Israeli steps. government has taken, has taken decisions. We have expressed our opinion on those decisions, but we are not alone. Others have. Um, the Security Council resolutions are also clear on that. Uh, I think it is one of these issues where it's important that everyone in the international community speak with one voice. Mr. Klein. Yes, uh, first a logistical question. Uh, will the Secretary General be taking any questions at tomorrow's briefing? Yes, on climate and on the- Specifically on climate. On climate, yes. Yeah. We hope, yes. On uh, okay, and uh, more substantively, uh, uh, you referred again to um, the pledges um, for uh, humanitarian funding mm -hmm. in Afghanistan, I believe the last time you uh, gave a percentage of pledges, it was 40-something percent? It was 45 percent, I think, on Friday. For, 45 percent. I don't think it's, I mean, the needle has not moved significantly okay. since then. And again, you, you, you said you want cash in hand, not just the pledges. So could you tell us how much cash has actually come in and from whom, from which well, countries? I, the list is publicly available on, the, on OCHA's website. They have the list of people the pledges and, and, and the rest. Um, it's 45% of $606 million. We asked for $606 million. We have received in cash 45% of that. Oh, oh okay. There's yeah. cash that was the percentage, not not just pledges then. No, no, no. I mean, pled, you know, we, we, we had the, the pledges that were received in September, in fact, went over the amount that we asked for. Okay. Uh, right. But 
we like promissory notes. Okay. We like cash better. All right, that's a clarification. Okay. Wanted. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Dulce. Uh, yeah, the uh, announcement that uh, Secretary of State Blinken had a phone call with uh, Antonio Guterres was on Thursday about Ethiopia. Has there been a development on that? I mean, did uh, Secretary of State have specific instructions for Antonio Guterres on the next step regarding uh, Michele Tigre? Thanks. Uh, I'm not aware that the Secretary of State gave instructions to the Secretary General. They did have a conversation, which Ethiopia and other issues uh, were discussed. I mean, the, the role of the United States and other member states is critical in everyone's efforts uh, to stop the fighting in Tigray. What were the other issues that were discussed? I will leave, I will leave it at that. Thank you. If to some, and then... Uh, any, any updates on... Um, humanitarian flights uh, to the Tigray and other uh, regions in northern Ethiopia? No, uh, the flights are still, this flights are still suspended. And uh, is there more information regarding what happened on Friday, I think, was? No, I mean, uh, oh, in terms of why the flight, I mean, uh, the flight was, was turned around. We didn't get the clearance. Obviously, uh, operating flights in, uh, in an area uh, even if Tigray is a rather large area, uh, but an area where there are <clears throat> there is an act, as we've seen, there's there are active airstrikes. So we've seen a number of them in the last few days. Is uh, a rather dicey proposition. So until um, we get the clearances we need and uh, we get the safety environment that we need to operate, uh, the flights have yet to resume. Okay. Thank you all. Thanks for your patience. And uh, hasta mañana. We'll have the SG here tomorrow morning at 9.15. He will take two or three questions, and then we'll continue with Inger Anderson.